in our endeavor to do this. So thank you for, for joining us. We also have the Fall River Symphony Orchestra Principal String Quartet with us today. And they're ready to play. So let's listen to them. My name is Christina Dixon Brownell. Um, I have been the concertmaster of the Fall River Symphony Orchestra for this is my 18th season. Um, I'm a freelance musician. Um, I teach violin and viola at Moses Brown School. And what I've been doing recently since March is uh, doing distance learning with my two kindergartners, my twin boys. So it's been it's good to be back playing music. Let's put it that way. My name is Tessa Belkin. I've been the principal second violin for the past two seasons, as well as the personnel manager. I teach violin privately, as well as viola, in the southeastern Massachusetts area for the past 10 years. In addition to playing and teaching, I like to knit. Hi, my name is Alicia Winslow. I'm the principal violist. I first played with the symphony back when I was 14 years old in 1996 and then took a hiatus when I went away to college and lived in Connecticut for about a decade. I've been back home for about six years now. I'm really enjoying my time playing back in the symphony again. I teach music in Westwood, Massachusetts and live in Severn, Rhode Island with my husband and two children. I'm Vi Taylor, a principal cellist for the Fall River Symphony. This, I believe, is my 10th year playing with the orchestra. I'm retired after a nearly three decades teaching in public and private schools and continue to teach privately in my home. Okay, hello everyone. So, this is new for us. Things are gonna be a little clunky, that's okay. We, we can do that. I understand that the live stream started a little bit late, but I do want to welcome you all here 
and I want to make sure that you know why we're here. So I'm, I'm just going to make sh uh, just go through our, our mission and our purpose of this one more time, just in case you didn't catch it the first time. And I also want to introduce to you our really important um, a special guest. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ray Daniels. I'm the music director of the Fall River Symphony Orchestra. And um, as we have been going through this pandemic experience, we've really been looking for ways to uh, connect with our audience. Um, we, we have this, uh, what I call the symbiotic relationship where we need you. We need to play in front of people as you just heard from our principal string quartet. And you need us, um, you know, going through this period without culture, without uh, art and, and, and this type of experience, um, it's not the very, very best for our hearts, our souls and our bodies. So we're here to try to bridge that gap. Um, our mission is threefold. Um, first, we want to educate our audience on this sector of music, um, which we're doing, and we're focusing on music of um, composers of African descent. You just heard um, a, a little snippet of um, um, sorry, Sancho <laughs> um, uh, as, as we were playing these story, string quartets just to begin with. And um, so we want to educate our audience. Uh, also, we want to acknowledge these composers and their contributions to um, this art form. And then lastly, we want to experience this music and by playing it, and we're going to do that today. Um, but without further ado, I would love to introduce our uh, special guest. She's going to be here with us for the season. This entire season is dedicated to composers of African descent. And we have for you today, and for the rest of our concerts, um, Ashley Gordon. Welcome, Ashley. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks so much, Ray, for having me. And to all those that are tuning in, I, I look forward to sharing this season with you. Uh, I am a violist. I am artistic and executive director as well as co-founder of Boston-based Kessel of Our Skins, which is now in its eighth season, concert and educational series that is really dedicated similarly to what this season with Fall Rivers is dedicated to, which is celebrating African diasporic composers. We do that through music, largely classical, um, but also infuse a lot of other arts as interdisciplinary uh, creativity has, has really been a beautiful way to share as wide and as deep a narrative of black artistry as wide and deep black artistry is. Uh, and we very much celebrate history and, and culture um, on stage, off stage, as that is equally important, that education that you speak about, right, is equally important as hearing. Um, the music. So a lot of, of what this season is dedicated to and the heart and mission of Castle of Our Skins, I think, are also symbiotically related. related. Uh, and I very much look forward to um, diving in. Great. Thank you so much. So let me set the stage for you. Um, um, this first composer that we're going to look at, Vicente Lusitano, uh, we don't know when he died, but we do know he died around 1561. We don't know how uh, when he was born either. Um, but I kind of want to, and I think it's important, I, I tell this to my students all the time, it's not just important to listen to the music to gather an experience, but to actually know what's happening in the world around that particular composer. This kind of gives you a, a great setting and, and a, a, a more a, a deeper appreciation for that, that music. So we're talking about um, the 16th century, which was a crazy time. The leading economic um, philosophy of this time is mercantilism. And, and, and this, this philosophy really is a, um, um, what I would say, a zero sum, no gain type of philosophy, where the idea is that in order to gather wealth, you have to take it from someone else. Not that you create wealth, but you, you basically, you take wealth. Then wealth is finite. And this was the idea of the day. Um, and this idea was the uh, catalyst to colonialism, to um, uh, imperialism. Um, Vicente Lusitano was a Portuguese composer. And in 
this whole idea of this economic philosophy was really embedded in this area, Portug Portugal and Spain. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Vasco da Gama, which was a great explorer, um, 1497 to 1499, he actually was the first European to go to the Spice Islands. Um, a couple of years prior to that, Christopher Columbus, 1492, of course, sailed to the Americas and it ended up um, on the Eastern shore. Um, but this was the, really the, the ictus of this imperialistic, colonialistic um, type of um, economic environment. Second idea that happened during this time was the church, the political uh, era. Um, we think about 1521, that is when um, we, sorry, 1517 is when um, Martin Luther nailed this 95 thesis on the door of the church. This was the beginning of the Reformation. It was in 1521 when the first uh, schism happened. So, you know, we're approaching the birth and, and the life of um, this, this great composer. It is important that we know other composers of this time. Uh, we think of this time, we think of William Byrd. The English composer, 1543, 1623. Um, Thomas Tallis, uh, Thomas Tillis, uh, Claudio Monteverdi. Uh, Monteverdi died in 1643, born in 1667. So just um, before, uh, just after um, uh, Lusitano was said to have died. So this is a, uh, a very interesting time in, in history and Let's figure out who, the, who this his composer is. Ashley, can you tell us about this this theorist, this um, composer? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for giving that that context. I think it, it is really important to have a holistic look at someone's life, since they obviously had um, all sorts of influences, uh, political, social, economic. Um, influencing their, their lives, which obviously influenced their music. Uh, Vicente Lusitano, um, his, his name Lusitano actually is Portuguese for Portugal, right? For, for um, being of Portugal. And so his name really is Vincent of Portugal. Um, he is Afro-Portuguese, a potentially mixed race. Uh, and as you had already indicated, is one that has a lot of mystery behind him. We don't really know when he was born. We also don't really know uh, when he died, which is a fault of um, ill record keeping, a fault of other political and, and social economic factors beyond his control. Uh, but we can kind of assume and sort of guess at around 1520, 1522, uh, he was born. So. This year is, is the 250th of, of Beethoven. This could also be the 500th anniversary of uh, Vicente Lusitano as well, um, too. He uh, was also one who was part of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church was one that really um, had a lot of presence in a lot of people's lives. There was a system of patronage at the time where if you wanted to be a composer, have an active career as, as a musician, you really needed to have um, an arm who could support you financially. And a, a huge arm at that time was the Catholic Church, supporting music like masses, like vocal motets that you may have also heard um, as well. Lusitano had some difficulty uh, making that career as, as a composer, but he very much was able to, like other Renaissance composers at the time, still compose a lot of choral based music. So you had mentioned some composers, other composers, Gesualdo and Palestrina, who we also think about as Renaissance composers writing choral based um, music. His sort of claim to fame for how we recognize him is as a theorist. Uh, and I know we're going to uh, dive in a little bit more about some of his music theories, um, but he is from what I, what I call the, the first black composer to publish his, his music. And that public, publication was part of one of his music theory treatise, treatises. Uh, later on, I know we're gonna talk about another composer who is also recognized as being the first uh, composer of African descent to uh, publish. But um, another sort of highlight about Vicente Lusitano, 
being this sort of man of, of mystery, uh, was a debate that happened in 1551 in, in Rome where he was sort of sparring a little bit with another theorist who had uh, sort of dissenting ideas about music. So Vicente Lusitano was really one who was trying to advocate diatonic um, scales and major and minor scales. He loved chromaticism, so the sort of slimy, uh, semitone, half-step climb that you uh, might hear in really prominently in his music, um, and really advocated for enharmonics, so a G sharp and an A flat being the same. Uh, he was up against another theorist at the time who really was trying to promote the idea of microtonal tuning, which is something in Western classical music uh, we don't necessarily see take hold of, certainly in, in uh, Baroque and in classical and sort of where we come to uh, today, but it's still a very much used in, in so many different styles of music. Uh, but at the time, he, Vicente Lusitano, was sort of challenging against this, and it's reported that he, that he won. Um, That's right. That's right. So, so this, is, this is a very interesting debate, and, and um, well, it's also interesting, 1551 was um, the year that Palestrina became uh, the Kapellmeister at, uh, in Rome at the Vatican. So, so uh, this, this debate was also there. Uh, there, were, there were, I mean, this was a big deal. Um, uh, as you know, Palestrina has this kind of um, reputation and some, some musicologists have kind of questioned it, but uh, Palestrina was supposed to perform polyphony, uh, polyphonic music, music that has multiple um, melodies at the same time versus a homophonic type of texture where it was more chordal. He was to perform this for the Pope to convince the Pope that it was not sacrilege to um, play this music. And so you, um, being that this debate was in Rome, I would probably would bet you that Palestrina was at the debate. Um, so, of course, uh, again, he started that, that gig in 1551 where this debate happened. And, this, and it, was, it was really a big deal. It's, I mean, I would imagine it being something like, uh, you know, Mike Tyson and um, Roy Jones Jr. You know, it, it, was, it was people came to this thing and people wanted to see what was going to happen. And um, Lusitano won. Um, the, 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 the argument was really is... Um, uh, Nicola Vicent, Vicentino was actually the other theorist, and he he was advocating for a different system where microtonalities were incorporated in Western music. Basically, he argued that there should be a 32 note octave scale, <laughs> which sounds kind of crazy. Um, he actually invented a keyboard with 30 with a 32 note octave. A keyboard uh, that does exist. He was an inventor as well. Um, but uh, Lusitano is like, you know what? We can achieve the same goals by staying diatonic using harmonic and chromaticism. And so, which is great, which is very interesting. Uh, the piece that we're going to listen to is um, um, a, a piece that really demonstrates this type of polyphonic textures. And I think that you're gonna be able to hear the chromaticism. It starts off with these, these um, um, just step ascension and it just keeps going up and it's very flowy. It is choral music. You're gonna hear it by the, um, our principal strings. Uh, this is the uh, Hume Domine by Lusitano.
Ignatius Sancho, who I'm so excited to talk to you about. Uh, Ignatius Sancho, born 1720, let me, 1729, let me set the stage here. Um, we're talking about Baroque music, Baroque times. Uh, you're going to hear in that last piece lots of ornamentations. Uh, so uh, we're, in a, we're in a totally different era. Uh, 1729, this was, uh, let's see, and I have some notes here. In April of that year, um, Johann Sebastian Bach did the second premiere of uh, Saint, his St. Saint Matthew's Passion. Um, Benjamin Franklin was 23 years old um, here, and uh, he wrote The Nature of Paper Currency. In, in, in the Americas. So um, this is our setting. Probably the biggest event that happened during this time is the Seven Years' War. It was huge. It was what Winston Churchill called the First World War. So on one side, you had uh, allies. You had um, Prussia, and which is modern-day um, Germany, and Great Britain. They were allied against... Um, France and Austria. Interestingly enough, Prussia um, had a king, King Frederick, uh, the, Frederick the Great, and in his house, his his private um, Kapellmeister or his court musician, his top court musician was C. P. Ebach. So he was writing music for Frederick the Great. It's true. It's amazing, and. Um, in the Americas, there was this debate, there was this dispute over what was French territory and what was um, Great Britain's territory. In Europe, uh, there was who's controlling the Holy Roman Empire between Prussia and Austria. So that is the, the, the Germans or slash Prussians and the Austrians, Holy Roman Empire and imperialism and um, colonization of the Americas between the, the Britons and the French. As they are, this is, this is such a crazy story. As, as they are, um, uh, the French are colonizing um, the uh, Ohio River, um, the, the Britons didn't trust what was going on. So they sent from Virginia, the governor of Virginia sent um, spies to go and see what was happening. Well, these spies so happened to get into a little scrimmage with some of the French and so happened to kill them. It's like 30 people. They killed one of these, they're calling a French diplomat. And it was one of the things that really kicked off the Seven Years' War. Um, the young general that was uh, the, running the spy mission was none other than George Washington. He was 21 years old. Um, crazy story. That started the Seven Years' War. Uh, and so seven, uh, 1754, uh, it, it was actually really about nine, um, um, nine years. It was, not, it was actually nine years. Um, 1754, 1756 to 1763. Uh, here, Ignatius Sancho would have been about 25 years old. But before we get to that time in his life, let's just start from uh, his humble beginnings. Um, this composer, abolitionist, writer, um, had an amazing life. First of all, he was born on a, sla a slave ship, um, coming from the West, uh, uh, sorry, West Africa, going into uh, the Caribbean Sea. Um, in a little island called Granada, which was near uh, Trinidad and, and uh, Tobago. It's just northeast of Venezuela. On his way on this journey, it is said that his father um, committed suicide by jumping off the ship because he would rather die than be a slave. His mother had him, of course, on the ship. And um, once they reached Gr Granada, um, Sometime after, while he was still in his infancy, she died. And then after about two years, when he's about two years old, he found himself in England. And we'll pick up this idea right after we hear the Fall River Symphony Orchestra 
string, principal string quartet play us some more beautiful music by Ignatius Sancho. <laughs> Nice. Thank you uh, to the Far River Symphony Orchestra, Principal Spring Quartet. Wonderful performance. You know, um, Ashley, 
I was just thinking, uh, as I was listening to that music, the, um, when he went to England, um, some people say he was given to these three sisters. Some people said that they bought him as a slave. Um, uh, but they, they, they were the ones who gave him the name Sancho. Um, and they, they, they named him after a character from the book Don Quixote, the, the squire from Don Quixote, which I, which I thought was very interesting. Um, so fill us in. Who was uh, Ignatius Sancho? And tell us about his contributions. Sure, yeah, Ignatius Sancho, um, wh whatever the story may be, ended up in England. He was orphan, uh, an orphan, as you said, his, his parents um, very early on in his infancy were no longer in his life, uh, and ended up in the hands of three English maidens, the Leggy sisters. It was very fashionable at the time um, to have in high aristocratic families, uh, um, middle, middle class, upper middle class families, black servants. And it was also very fashionable at the time to uh, parade them and showcase them in a, in a very exotic fashion. So they would dress Sancho in what they considered uh, African garb and sort of, again, parade him like a show horse. Um, the nickname of Sancho was a not not a fond sort of cute name, but one that was actually derogatory um, as, as he was kind of short and stout and, and was not um, a, a term of endearment. Uh, the Leggy sisters were not sisters who were warm and open armed, which is something certainly uh, a product of the time since we are still very much talking about uh, the mid-Atlantic slave trade um, system from which Ignacio uh, was a, a byproduct and eventually became uh, a seller um, in the same uh, system. But the Leggy sisters uh, very much, again, following the fashion of the time, had uh, a black servant, uh, Ignacio Sancho, and threatened him uh, to, when he would sort of showcase this really omnivorous, insatiable curiosity for learning, they would threaten to send him back to a plantation in the Caribbean uh, if he would not be uh, a servant, right? Um, he was he was very very curious, uh, and the Leggy sisters knew that uh, trying to foster this curiosity would be dangerous. They actually said, and I quote: "African ignorance was only security uh, for his obedience, and that to enlarge the mind of their slave would go near to emancipate this person." So um, Ignatius, again very curious, ended up with the the uh, second Duke of Montague who was far more lenient, far more generous, and was able to show, showcase him to the music of Handel um, and arts and other letters and things like this, and sort of take him under his wing. Of course, the Leggy sisters did not approve of this, um, but eventually Sancho was able to, to leave those sisters who were, again, um, not allowing him to uh, live, live a life, right? Uh, what th that was very much, um, filled with curiosity, and he ended up going to, uh, again, the second Duke of Montague. Uh, that Duke passed away, and eventually the Duchess uh, embraced him as a butler, and when she passed away, uh, actually gave him a legacy of 70 pounds, an annuity of 30 pounds annually um, in about 1751. So he actually came into a, sort of a small earning. But he was very, again, curious, self-taught in many, many areas. He enjoyed the arts and really surrounded himself with a whole circle of creative people, painters, writers, um, artists, other creatives. And uh, through, through his, again, just sense of wonderment, very much wanted to be a actor uh, because he loved theater and he loved plays so much. Um, that was a financial short-lived dream. Uh, so he ended up taking his earnings at about the late 1770s uh, and opened up a shop uh, selling, again, ironically, tobacco, sugar, other products from the, the slave trade route. And this shop was really one that provided him and his family, his wife and six children, uh, financial stability, economic stability. It also provided him uh, uh, opportunity to vote, which we'll talk about, I think, a little bit later, uh, as well as a space to have um, 
those creatives, again, those other artists and thinkers uh, in, in a shared space, sort of a modern cafe that we might think of today, or just sort of a bustling hotspot for uh, creativity, for ideas. Um, he also sort of thinking about his life, if I were to create a play about it or, or see a little movie about it, I would see him being one that is very, very social. So it makes perfect sense for me that he would want to include social music. So he would want to include dances and minuets and invite men and women to be able to sing, to invite amateurs to be able to, his, to, to play his music and literally come together and celebrate uh, and move and dance. Uh, so these minuets and, and uh, dances that we're hearing today are very much um, reminding me of Sancho being this very social, social person. You know, I, I would have to agree with you if I was to share that vision of what it would be like in his life, in his world, uh, as, a, as a just like a social being. Uh, he, would, he seems like a, a very connected, um, um, a bubbly type fellow that's engaged in his community. Uh, I think I read where um, he once said that when he was out like at a park with his family, that people would kind of look at him like who is this guy you know um and it, it was it was it was he 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 very much knew his blackness in in his space um but he was certainly totally connected um with the community ar around him which i thought was very special also um and this this is our actually a really great place to to play some more music and we and we will do just that um but on several of the pieces that we're playing, he wrote, um, you know, this is dedicated to the, um, the, the I, w I wish I had brought it with me, the, um, uh, the right uh, upright um, Mont Sir Montagu. So he, 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 he donated a lot of, uh, sorry, he, he um, wrote a lot of music in the honor of the Montagues, uh, which he had a, a really great relationship with and that they sponsored him in so many different ways. So let's listen to some more of that music. Thank you. 
in in the United States, they were inspired uh, about um, by him and his writings. Um, so, can you can you go a little bit deeper into that and tell us a little bit more? Sure. I I think it. For me, it very much is reflective of the totality of, of who he is, of his life, um, sharing the story of literally fleeing and, and taking uh, his, his life quite literally in his own hands uh, and prospering as, as a creative and being respected um, as, as a creative person. He literally, as, as, a, as a musician, as a self-taught, very, very learned man, was sought after for his opinion. And I have uh, from a uh, American scholar, Ma Kuni Hare, um, in her Negro and um, their music anthology, she has a, a excerpt from one of Sancho's letters uh, to, to a, a friend of his. And I'll read a little bit from that letter just to, just to really show how much people sought him as being someone to um, gain their uh, sort of trust, I guess, and, and approval. Um, well, I have, criti have critically examined thy song. This is Sancho speaking. Some parts I like well. I will certainly attempt giving it a tune such as I can the first leisure, but it must undergo some little pruning uh, when we meet. So he, he was someone who um, people would really seek for guidance and for help. Uh, he would sign his his works as the African, so very much um, presenting his identity centerfold as opposed to um, and any, anything else and really embracing his identity, which is kind of a radical idea if you think about it. Um, he was also quite prolific uh, and is totally, with again, his life and his work defying the idea of lesser than or not capable of or um, not intelligent. He, he wrote four volumes of music. He wrote a, a, a theory of music as well. Um, about 70, uh, 62, sorry, works in total. Uh, some of these dances that we're hearing today, as well as a whole number of songs, again, to be performed by literally anyone, amateurs, men, women uh, alike. He also wrote detailed choreography for those uh, songs for, for dancers and uh, had such an imagination that again defies what is common common knowledge at the time about there even being an imagination if, if you're a black person. As a business owner, uh, he earned the right uh, to, to vote and he, he took that seriously and he did. He voted for Charles uh, James Fox, who was the leader of the um, opposition to parliament at the time. Again, his, his shop, uh, his, his business was um, a, a bustling space. It was one that uh, one of his sons afterwards took and uh, reformatted to be a bookstore and became the first black uh, English bookstore owner. Um, Ignacio Sancho, again, as, as we had talked about, had had also been seen as being the first composer of African descent, although we, we certainly in this episode are talking about Vicente Lusitano some, some centuries uh, prior as well too. Um, and, and really, again, Sancho was a man of prose. He wrote uh, several plays as an aspiring actor uh, and wrote a number of these letters, one of which I just shared a little excerpt. And those letters um, were published posthumously by his son in 1803. And that really did help change the perspective of uh, the enslaved people not, not having the capability or the fortitude of imagination, um, which uh, again, as you say, is, is a very again, radical thought and one that abolitionists have really prided about to say, no, actually there's this, there's this example, it's well documented. Um, and it has, has, again, been used as a tool to really showcase and highlight um, not only Sancho's potential, but to, to highlight he is not an anomaly during this time as well. I, I think you, you, you summed it up right there, that he's not an anomaly. And too often um, we want to make such artists that. And I think that is why we're here today, uh, to kind of shine some light in that particular area. Thank you for, for sharing that. That's, that's excellent. Let's listen to um, the last set, or, or I, should, I should say, I've, I've kind of, I've kind of um, grouped these uh, 12 dances into three sets. So this is the last of those three. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. We have had uh, a really good time um, learning a lot, exploring a lot of music, and really visiting these two composers. Uh, this is one concert out of our season to come. Um, please look forward to the Fall River Symphony Orchestra Holiday Pops um, tradition, which is um, going to be um, broadcast this, the entire month of December on the, um, the, our, our local uh, access, uh, public access uh, here in Fall River. Um, we will also be posting a link on our Facebook page. Uh, and then we have several other um, concerts to come focusing on this music. Um, so um, please look, uh, go to our website for listings. Uh, I want to thank you, Ashley, for joining us today. Um, I'm so happy that we are collaborating. And I, I've been wanting to work with you for quite some time, and here we are. So um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I also like to thank the Narrows Center for the Arts uh, here in Fall River. That's where we are today. Um, they have graciously donated their space and also their service, uh, Patrick and his team. Uh, and we really appreciate you and we hope that we can work with you again in the future. Um, to those of you who are tuned in, um, please, uh, if you feel like um, contributing to our cause, we would love for you to do so. Also, jump over to Castle of Our Skins. Go check out what uh, Ashley is doing over there. Her program is robust and diverse. You have to check it out. So please go and visit them. And also, um, let's not forget the Fall River Symphony Orchestra principal string players. Um, today they did a wonderful job bringing us some fantastic music and they will take us out. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time.